Next on Signals, Xavier Riesseral, author of the book Revelations. His research uncovers astonishing secrets. Messages were given by the Blessed Virgin Mary at Garabandal, La Salette, Fatima, and Akita. Many of the secrets point in a particular direction. Escalating trouble in Europe with Russia and the distinct possibility of a third world war. What to know and how to prepare. Here's my extraordinary interview with Zevia Ries Aral. Once again, thank you ever so much for your ever so gracious invitation, for your kind reception, and for your uh, good spirit to want to bring forth to the faithful the message from heaven. Could we begin with um, a prayer of St. Michael the Archangel and a Hail Mary in Latin? Would that be all right? Absolutely. I say uh, the St. Michael prayer every day. Splendid. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl around the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, et Mater Nostre, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. So, yes, um, I responded gratefully to your invitations, particularly in view of the uh, present situation we are living today. As you know, as my accent betrays me, I'm a Frenchman who has married an American young lady. I have two beautiful Franco-American children. And uh, just to briefly introduce myself, I worked for a few years with uh, Father René Laurentin, as the American pronounce his name, René Laurentin in French, before he was a Monsignor, and before he became blind, before he passed away in 2017. Father René Laurentin was uh, called by the Americans as uh, Marion Jacques Cousteau, uh, as he was renowned to be the foremost expert in marine apparition sites. I worked with him for a few years, uh, on a particular case. And um, although I didn't have, despite of the time I spent with him, I didn't have the time, uh, all the time I wished to spend with him. I met with him in Ivory, in Paris, outside Paris, and we worked together for many years on this case. I had a chance to get acquainted with him. Uh, although he could have been my father, possibly even more so my grandfather, the difference of uh, generation uh, didn't seem to perturb us too much due to the fact that we came from the same source, the same background, same upbringing, same stories of yesteryears. He did the war, the Second World War. He participated in the French army. My family was uh, an old family who always joined the colors uh, when France called for his sons to defend the nation. And so when I met with Father Laurentin, it was really as a young man, I was 25 years old. And now I regret to say 54. And uh, yet, since <coughs> that time, mm. I've continued to uh, to be interested in marine apparition sites uh, in Europe and in, Northern, in the Northern American continent and even uh, further south in uh, South America. So today, um, 
I've public, I'm promoting a book I've written, my first one in English. I wrote a few before in France, in Italy, and in Germany. This a book, my first in America, in the United States, is called Revelations. And uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. And <laughs> and it holds for um, uh, it's sold uh, rather. I have for the sole ambition to bring forth now uh, echo a message which should have been echoed many many years ago by the formal authorities of the Catholic Church's hierarchy, and which they have failed miserably to do so. Not accidentally, mind you, but rather in a calculative manner, which makes it considerably a graver situation. You could say that relating to our times, which we are living today, particularly in the geopolitical scene with the Russian-Ukrainian war, with the situations, the changes of political regimes in as much in the European Union as in the United States and Canada. Uh, these events, which we are only now beginning to decipher as foretold apparitions and prophecies, have really begun through the first apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary on September 19th, 1846, in a little village uh, on the Franco-Italian Alps called La Salette. Now, this particular apparition was the beginning of a series of admonitions that were echoed again and again and again by heaven through heaven's favorite and chosen emissary, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, the same uh, woman who was responsible for being or for interceding for humanity, for mankind, in a little village called Cana 2,000 years ago, asking her son to do a miracle when his time had not come yet. Simply, the Virgin Mary has come here through La Salette, through La Frode, through Fatima, through Garabandal, through Akita and other places to repeat the same message she gave in that same little village in Israel, in Cana. The message is very simple. Do everything my son tells you to. Why did heaven feel necessary to send again and again the mother of God to send the same message, a warning, a message of admonition when we have the Catholic Church? In La Salette, the version was very clear. Why? Because the church, particularly the clergy of the time and of the times yet to come, from then to now, have fallen into many temptations, have fallen in the sin of pride, have fallen into wanting to follow their honors, a better life, rather than the path of the cross chosen by our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what she said in La Salette. That is what she said in Tilly, another parishion site approved in Normandy. That is what she said in La Frode to French stigmatist Marie-Julie Jani, informally approved in writing by her local bishop, Monseigneur Fournier, on June the 6th, 1876, if memory serves. And again, years later in Fatima, and again in Akita, all formally approved, not merely by the local bishops of Fatima and Akita, but by the congregation of the doctrine of the faith, which on both occasions declared the apparitions and the messages of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Fatima and Akita be worthy of belief. As in La Salette, as in um, Tilly. The message is possibly repetitive, but no less important, no less grave. If I were to make an analogy, I would say this, and please forgive me if I tend to be very long-winded. I uh, always apologize of this same lack of character on my part with uh, John Henry Weston, with uh, <laughs> Telemarchan and others. Please do interrupt me. I'm sure your auditors will be grateful to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, please. Uh, I, I want to hear you. Uh, I'll, I'll chime in if I hear a, a pause. 
<laughs> feel, You're most feel, kind. Feel free to express yourself in any way as long as you want. You're most kind. Thank you. Well, the message is um, it, to make an, an analogy is this. It is as if we were driving in a motor car 200 kilometers per hour straight towards a wall you know, of cement. And the version may appear to us telling us, my children, you must turn the wheel 45 degrees before it's too late. If you do not, you will go to your doom and you will perish. The same thing can be said for these apparitions, which have been carefully, methodically investigated, investigated, uh, reviewed, analyzed by the proper authorities assigned by the Blessed Virgin Mary, assigned by the Roman Catholic Church, rather. And these particular messages all say the same thing. We must convert before it's too late. In Fatima, I would like to remind particularly those who perhaps never heard of these particular messages. The prophecies of Fatima, the secrets of Fatima, were very clear, but were all were stated in the conditional tense. The Virgin in 1917 told the children of Fatima, if my children do not return to my son, if my children do not convert in time, there will be a second world war worse than this one. If my children do not return to my son and convert, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world and great tribulations will follow suit. This particular message, which was in fact part of the second secret of Fatima, was approved, studied, and finally recognized, I believe in 1930, memory serves. And nonetheless, this message was often, too often, subject of ridicule, subject of mockery, and the church, instead of mounting a campaign aimed at echoing on the four corners of the world, this particular message, this admonition, calling humanity the faithful to prayer, to the rosary, to the church, to conversion, decided more and more with time to sweep away this warning, this message of love from such an imploringly loving mother. And this message was swept under a carpet of convenience, a carpet of forgetfulness. Perhaps it was not convenient either to reveal the third secret of Fatima as instructed by the Blessed Virgin Mary. Her instructions were nevertheless quite clear and not subject to interpretation. Indeed, the virgins clearly stated and asked for this famous third secret of Fatima to be revealed either at the moment of the passing away of Sister Lucia dos Santos or no later that in 1960. In 1960, the pontiff of Rome, the, the Holy Father, the Pope, was none other than John XXIII, who, amongst witnesses, among which His Eminence Cardinal Ottaviani, opened the two envelopes that Sister Lucia dos Santos wrote, as per the request of the Archbishop of Fatima in 1943. The first envelope, revealed a vision which we are all familiar with, which has been released, I believe, in June of the year 2000 by His Eminence Cardinal Bertone, no? who, remarkably enough, and I will remain diplomatic, decided to declare that this was the full content of the third secret of Fatima. That was nothing short of a lie. There were indeed two envelopes that were written, and the second one contained an accompanying message of the Blessed Virgin Mary through Lucia dos Santos, which was read not only by Pope John XXIII, but by Cardinal Ottaviani under an oath of secrecy and silence, and by others as well, among which a famous American Irish priest called, I believe, Reverend Father Martin Malak Malachi Martin, I believe. Yes, I know, was, I'm aware uh, of him. Yes, he was a Jesuit, remarkably enough. Mm -hmm. uh, An exorcist, too. Exorcist, too. And even more remarkably so, a good one. <laughs> I'm saying this, I can't take the liberty of saying so. I've been raised by the Jesuits in Paris. But uh, 
the Jesuits are renowned to be good teachers, not always good politicians. So this particular message was clear. And when uh, Pope John XXIII read it, according to the testimonies of those present, he became white as an aspirin, French expression, and decided to put back, after folding back the third secret of Fatima, inside the envelope stating, this message does not relate for our times. Really? Remarkable. Does it mean that God, in his infinite wisdom, possibly could have made a mistake when he ordered his Holy Mother to instruct the Church to reveal it publicly in 1960? Could it be perhaps even better that Pope John XXIII was wiser than our Lord and our God the Father? It takes a tremendous sense of self-assuredness to state such a statement. Remarkable. Nevertheless, he did, and he stated so. And this third secret of Fatima was placed into the secrecies of the vaults of the Vatican until half of them were released in June of the year 2000 as per request of His Holiness John Paul II. Disobedience, pride, that is exactly what Our Lady said the Church would fall under in La Salette when she appeared to Maximin Giraud and to Melanie Calva in 1846, September to be precise. Well, the story doesn't end there, does it? After uh, the apparition, the apparition singular, for there was only one, of La Salette, secrets in La Salette were revealed, which remarkably enough, the Archbishop of Grenoble, whose jurisdiction was over the little village of La Salette, decided, because of the uncomfortable message, political and theological, of the Blessed Virgin Mary in La Salette, although it's been approved formally by the Archbishop and the Dicasterium of the Doctrine of the Faith, decided to place the secret of La Salette into an iron box, seal it, surround it with some sort of, uh, of cord, and send it to be lost in the depths of the library of the Holy Vatican, the Holy See, only to be found by sheer accident in 1999, by Reverend Father de Courteville, who was remarkably enough as well, an assistant of Father René Laurentin, the famous Mariologian, uh, whom I had the honor uh, to work with for a few years. No? When uh, Father Courteville found the box, immediately he um, analyzed it, observed it, and immediately recognized the seal of the Archdiocese of Grenoble, immediately cut it with a Swiss knife, opened the box and found the famous secret of La Salette. Immediately, the rhyme began to ring inside the Vatican's library. He took the box under his arm and left straight, asking for a rendezvous with the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, whose prefect at the time was none other than his eminence, Cardinal Ratzinger, future oh. Pope Benedict oh. XVI. Mm. Exactly. So the rendezvous was taken, he arrived, showed the box and its content to the good card German cardinal, who immediately gave him primatur and permitted the publication of said secret. Now, the secret is the story, the message is quite long. So I will try to abbreviate for we indeed we, from what I understand, our time is limited and we have a lot of material to cover. But to make it short, the message announced that there would be future conflicts that would involve Napoleon III, which took place exactly as predicted. That there would be a first, a second world war, which were clearly depicted in the messages, and a third one, which would see the destruction of the French capital, Paris, and the annihilation of the city of Marseille, which would sink in the Mediterranean Sea. There would be, according to said messages, three major cities that would be pulverized and would disappear from the map. Paris being one of them, I regret to say. The Virgin said, furthermore, that there would be tribulations within the Roman Catholic Church which would not find or recognize itself any longer. A false church will rise from the one that today we are aware of. The Roman Catholic Church, the Dicasterium, or rather the Magisterium, and the doctrine of the faith must and will remain at all times infallible 
And we, that, is, that should remain our star of Bethlehem, our compass. For this can never be changed, either through the decree of man or of angel. This is an infallible truth. The Gospels, the Roman Catholic Catechism, the deposit of the faith, cannot be touched nor changed. By Pope or man. The version also described the fact that Rome would become the city of the Antichrist. And that an Antichrist, quote unquote, will sit on the seat of Peter temporarily. She mentioned that the Antichrist would one day be born from an illicit union between a Judaic uh, nun and a bishop, Catholic bishop. This Antichrist will be born uh, monstrously with teeth, screaming some sorts of abomination and feeding on all sorts of impurities. He will have brothers, but his brothers will not be the devil incarnate, but possessed souls. He, the Antichrist, will be, according to the message, the devil incarnate. The Virgin Mary, as well in La Salette, has brought forth another extraordinary prophecy, in addition to the war, to the coming of the Antichrist, and the fall of the Church. She mentioned as well, which was at the time nothing short but unacceptable, <laughs> politically speaking, that is. She mentioned and explained that there would be a king that would be the direct des descendant of the martyr king and queen of France. Now, for those of you who are fads of uh, French history, the martyr king, the martyr queen of France in our history books are known as Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. According to La Salette, uh, the descendant, direct descendant of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette will be called to take again the power of France in its dearest moments, in a time when France will be again on its knees and out of breath. We have as a testimony of this particular and extraordinary prophecy, the following story, anecdote, which was confirmed by the Count of Vincey, Henri de Vincey, who happened to be uh, the Count of Chambord, best friend and secretary. For those of you, and I don't blame, the Americans are not familiar with French history as the French are not always familiar with American history. But the Count of Chambord uh, was at the time in the late 1850s, 1860s, the direct pretender to the French crown in a France which became a republic. Well, actually an empire called Napoleon III. But after the Franco-Prussian War, which France lost to the Prussians, and we lost as well two regions of France called Alsace and Lorraine, the further eastern two provinces of France to Germany. The emperor himself, Napoleon III, was captured by the Prussians and made prisoner. He used to play chess with the Kaiser, uh, who came to visit him quite often. The emperor Napoleon III, who was a nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon I, being so humiliated, decided after the war and the capitulation that he would not return to France, he still between his legs, but rather would leave into exile to London in England. And so there we were. France was starting to, to bring uh, back to uh, itself on its feet from the ashes of defeat and humiliation. So a new election was set up on a national level. And the new deputies of France, were, remarkably enough, were in their great majority royalist. And they were all in favor of restoring the monarchy in France and uh, in the memory of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. So they went to see the Comte de Chambord, who at the time was living in the castle of Falstaff in Austria. So they came to him and told him, look, and you'll understand the relationship with the message of La Salette. You'll be very surprised. So they came to see uh, the Comte and said, look, uh, Your Grace, we came as we are all in favor of uh, restoring the French monarchy and you being the proper descendant of the Bourbon family, the royal family, we want to offer you the throne and the crown. The Count of, of um, Chambord was delighted and of course said, naturally I would accept. So the French deputies went back to France to take care of preliminary uh, futilities that needed to be done first and to come back with the final papers to be signed. 
However, Providence, that is divine providence, decided that the events for the country of France and the world would go in a different direction. The little visionary of La Salette, the boy, Maximin, Cal Maximin Giraud, was informed and instructed by the Virgin Mary on that particular day in the mountains of La Salette that the day would come when he would become a man, that he would be called to meet with the Count of Chambord and reveal to him another part of the secret of La Salette, which was this. The secret of this part of the secret of La Salette was that indeed the son, the 10 year old son of Louis XVI and of Marie Antoinette, thought to have died in the cell of the jail of Le Temple in Paris, had in fact survived, been replaced by the corpse of a young teenager, and survived and left the country. His descendant, future descendant, would one day be called to come to France and restore France to its glory of yesteryears and restitute the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church uh, in the ways uh, of tradition, in the rules uh, and in the manners our fathers and theirs before them adored our Lord through this particular um, institution. So when uh, Maxima Giro met with the uh, Comte de Chambord, the Count was somewhat perplexed and didn't want really to meet with him. But he was convinced of a variety of friends. And so uh, when uh, young um, Maxima Giraud approached, he was intimidated to see this grandeur, this great castle and these two magnificent gentlemen ahead of him. So when he said uh, to the Count, uh, Your Grace, I need to give you this secret in private, immediately the Count de Vancey, who was the best friend, and as I mentioned earlier, the best friend and secretary of the Comte de Chambord got up and was about to leave, but immediately was stopped by the Comte de Chambord who asked him to stay and witness the exchange. However, the Comte de Chambord took young Maximin Giraud to a window close by and they were talking. The Comte de Vancey could not hear anything, but this, he saw that the Comte de Chambord was putting his hand on his forehead and appeared to be emotional and was swallowing his tears. Finally, uh, they came back to the Count of Vancey, and the Count de Chambord was trying to convince young Maxima Giraud to take a roll of gold coins for his trouble. Young Giraud um, said no, that it would not be proper for him to fulfill the mission of the Blessed Virgin Mary and taking payment for it. His payment was expected elsewhere. So at least the Count was able to convince him to take care of the fees for uh, the train fees to return to France. And finally addressed his uh, best friend, the Count de Vancey, telling him, look, my friend, our Lord has decided to let us know of a particular secret. My cousin Louis XVII, son of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, has survived and has descendants. And they will have descendants of their own. One day who will be aimed to, will be charged to sit upon the throne of France and deliver it from a tremendous evil. Hence... I cannot accept the proposal of the French deputies. Mm. But I cannot tell them the instructions were, I cannot reveal this secret. It will be revealed all in God's good time. The Count of Vancey wrote this story, this letter, to his family. And it was years on the, in the 20th century, finally divulged publicly. Yeah. So finally the deputies came and offered once again the Count to sign the papers for the restoration of the monarchy in France. And for many days, the Count was wondering, I cannot reveal the secret. What am I going to tell those deputies? So he came up with um, a pretext, which, and this is a story which very few historians know. So I'm revealing to you truly and to your auditors a true secret of history. So he came up with a pretext which he knew would not be accepted. The restoration of the French flag, under which was drawn under Louis XIV, the French flag white with golden fleur de lis. That was flag of France forever. And when he proposed this, he knew the deputies would not accept because the French people would not accept. It would be another revolution yet again. So finally, the deputies went back in France, tremendously disappointed. And on an interview of um, one a proeminent French magazine, one of the deputies said, this Count of Chambord refused the crown of France for a single handkerchief. 
<laughs> oh, and so yes, yes. Yeah. So he he wanted to make himself unappealing. He purposefully did that so that uh, people would reject him. Is is that uh, the correct way to express it? Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. You understood exactly what he was trying to do. Very few, very, very, very few historians were able to explain this. They don't understand to this day. You know now, mm. and your auditors, the real reason. Mm. And this is a reported historical events. This is not a legend. It is the truth, historically uh, written. Amazing. So it is. So that was part of one of the secrets of La Salette. The other parts of La Salette, you just got the great lines. But after La Salette, the church, instead of echoing this message, inviting the faithful to more faith, to more conversion, to the sacraments, to the gospels, to the, to the Eucharist, to confession. Instead of doing this, with time, popularity became an absolute must, particularly for clergy. And not just for that particular clergy in Europe or in France or for that particular time. But it went on crescendo, the level of mediocrity within the church. From the, all the way to the end of the 19th century to the 20th century, and now to the 21st century in which we are living now. The 21st century. That being said, since then, since La Salette, there were other apparitions that came again and again. Why? One must wonder, why does heaven think it so necessary for the messages, the same messages, to be repeated again and again. Could it possibly be, perhaps, because the church is not doing or fulfilling the mission that our Lord Jesus Christ bestowed upon them through Peter? Could it possibly be that? One wonders. Oh, does wonder. Does one wonders. Indeed, I wonder no longer. After La Salette, there was, of course, La Frode. In La Salette, the Virgin Mary to all the children that there was no one who was willing to offer themselves as a victim soul for the liberation of France, for the re, uh, institution of the Roman Catholic Church, until that is the coming of Marie-Julie Jeanne, who offered herself as a martyr soul, as a victim soul. That woman not only was a stigmatist, but was able to have all of the stigmata of our Lord Jesus Christ, all of them without exception, contrary to others. No, even St. Francis of Assisi didn't have them all. Marie-Jurie Janie did. The crown, mm. the hands, mm -hmm. the side, the feet, yes. the back, yes. everything. Similar to Anne Catherick Emmerich. Indeed. Indeed. And Marie-Jurie Janie suffered the passion of our Lord every single Friday of her existence. Mm. Took upon her body innumerable sufferings for the conversion of sinners. Even uh, after the passing away of Bishop Fournier, as I mentioned earlier, wrote an informal letter stating and approving Marie-Julie Janie as a messenger of heaven from and subject to supernatural events sent from God. No. Mm. The next bishop who took and replaced him, and there were plenty, brief parenthesis, there were plenty of formal theological uh, and scientific investigation of Marie-Julie Janie, the, her gravitations, her blood pouring out of her body, her being able to recognize and understand foreign languages, her being able to detect whether religious objects were indeed blessed or not, uh, mm. immense and unconditional mm. love and mm. tenderness and profound affection for the Roman Catholic Church, for the Blessed Virgin Mary, and for our Lord Jesus Christ. She was attacked by the devil and hit and offered the suffering to the Virgin Mary again, for the conversion of sinners and for the restitution of the Catholic Church. That woman was extraordinary. And we are told that the Virgin Mary informed um, Marie-Julie Janie that the day will come when her picture will be placed next of that of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette on altars and will be recognized as a saint. Furthermore, not only were her apparitions extraordinary, her prophecies and revelations completely and confirmed by the pages of history. But it was told, or rather, Marie-Julie Jeanne was told that the day will come when her sister and herself would be one day, long after they 
passed away, their bodies will be exhumed and found incorrupt. Furthermore, the Virgin Mary informed, no, it was not the Virgin Mary, it was our Lord Jesus Christ, he informed Marie-Julie Jeanne, and upon the process of exhumation of her body, not only will the authorities find her body absolutely intact, but they will find that her body still holds a beating heart. <laughs> this may be some people who say that's impossible. That will never happen. Never happened before. It will not happen in this instance. Wrong. This particular instance happened before with St. Joan of Arc. This was, can, can be found in the process of rehabilitation of St. Joan of Arc in the, um, again, in the pictures of history. This is not a legend. But indeed, after the first uh, execution of the body of St. Joan of Arc on the um, place of execution in the city of Rouen, after the boiling oil was placed over her remains, everything disappeared except for her entrails and her heart, <laughs> which remained beating. Immediately, the executioner ran to Cardinal Warwick and told him, uh, Your Eminence, Your Eminence, the witch's heart is, in, is incorrupt and is still beating. So the Cardinal said, Remake a new pot of boiling, of boiling oil and have it consumed immediately the remains of the witch. The poor man immediately executed the orders, threw again this hor horrid boiling oil on top of the remains of the saint, which once again remained intact and once again beating. <laughs> this is history. This is not legend. It's astonishing. Indeed. And uh, the executioner, when seeing this, became alarmed, ran towards the, one of the priests who used to be the confessor of Joan of Arc, got on his knees and begged to be confessed. For indeed, he, he screamed, and this is very well known in the histories of France, Father, Father, confess me, for I have burned a saint. The same promise has been given to the remains of Marie-Julie Jeanne. That will indeed be the print of God on a prophecy yet that has come to become a reality. I said yet again, because indeed, Marie-Julie Jeanne, since she began receiving her apparitions, I believe it began in 1870, until her passing away in 1941, during the German occupation of France, Marie-Julie Jeanne received multitudes of prophecies for the world, and for France in particular, all of which till now have come to be exact to a T. To give you a couple of examples, the announcement of the, um, after the Franco-Prussian uh, War of another war that would be the First World War, a universal war, which would restore to France, to France's victories and her allies, the two regions that we lost to the Prussians, Alsace and Lorraine, during the Franco-Prussian War. The Virgin and our Lord and St. Michael the Archangel Appearing to Marie Julie Jeanne announced as well a second world war, worse than the first one, that will see a disaster and the conception of a particular people in Europe. Then the version announced that there would be another war yet again in the French colonies, particularly in the northern country of Africa, Algeria, the French Algerian War, which we're all familiar with. Then, remarkably enough, the version said that decades later, France and the entire European continent would be subjugated by massive hordes of um, uh, foreigners that would come from Northern Africa, Muslim nations, and Sub-Saharan nations. Now, keep in mind, those messages were given in the late 1800s. Northern Africa comprised possibly poss maximum of somewhere between 25 to 55, 60 million Arabs all together. The idea of seeing Europe <laughs> being subjugated by an immigration, principally of Muslims and non-Christians, was at the time considered sheer rubbish, mm. unrealistic rubbish. Mm. It was not credible or believable. And you cannot blame the people. It wasn't realistic at the time. So which gives her today considerable credibility. Yes. Because indeed, being a Frenchman, I have to tell you, it is not a coincidence or an accident that I live on this side of the Atlantic today. 
like many of my countrymen. I do not recognize the country I was born or I grew up in anymore. Mm. Today, France is a country that is profoundly divided between Frenchmen who love their nations, whose families have taken the arms to defend the colors, and by a new sort of French citizen who calls themselves so, who wear and carry the papers, but who spit on the memory of our fathers and theirs before them, on the glory of our history and of our past, and who do, and who do not forgive the French nation for the humiliation of the empire and the colonies, despite of the fact that, contrary to the English, when we colonized countries in Africa, we allowed the locals to vote for their own governors, unlike the English. We were the only colonial powers who permitted that sort of thing. But nevertheless, a complex has completely consumed these people and have not forgiven France for the humiliation of the, uh, of the colonies. <laughs> that being said, Marie-Julie Jeanne announced yet further prophecies which have not yet come to pass, although she, among other things which were extraordinary, she announced, she predicted before it took place, the death of the visionary of La Salette, um, Melanie Calva, the place, the day, and the time when she would pass away. And it happened exactly as she predicted. The same thing with the Comte of Chambord we just heard about. The uh, Marie-Julie Jeanne echoed the prophecy as to when the good count would pass away, when, what day, what time, exactly. Mm. Mm. All of the prophecies, without exception, given by Marie-Julie Jeanne from the moment of her life till today, as we speak to, to as we're speaking today, on uh, August the 29, 2023, have taken place without any errors. So what is the future? What does the future hold, will you ask? Marie-Julie Jeanne was extremely clear. I regret to say. This is the stigmatist. The stigmatist, the French yes. Briton woman yes. who had a stigmatist and who was informally approved through a letter by her local bishop. And yes. later supported by Pope Pius the Twelfth and before him by Leo the Thirteenth, who had a tremendous admiration and support of Marie Julie But remember, it was not the Pope's or the Pontiff's role to either approve formally or informally an apparition site. But nevertheless, Pope Leo the Thirteenth and Pope Pius the Twelfth supported and encouraged Marie Julie to continue with her works. So, what does the whole future hold? Marie-Julie Jeanne, before the passing away of Queen Elizabeth, announced that the Queen of England will cease to reign in England and would be replaced by another, another monarch. But that the family of the, this monarch and those who will re rule England will all, through some sort of event, perish. England will be afflicted by tremendous evils. She mentioned that in the course of a particular time, there would be tremendous geopolitical tensions between England, um, Persia, which at the time Iran was did not exist, so she used the name Persia, and, um, and uh, Palestine, which at the time she meant Israel, but Israel did not exist until uh, the follow the mid 1940s, 47. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So then afterwards, she mentioned that a war would take place in Eastern Europe which would uh, first linger, and which would call, among other, other nations, the armies of France to join Eastern Europe, and the armies of France will likewise be called to go in Africa. Now, I have to tell you a secret, a personal secret, that is. When I wrote this book of mine, Revelations, and I read, this was before the Ukraine war took place, I started this last, I think it was in, was it 2017? I believe it was 2017, 2018. I thought to myself, France will send troops in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe in 2017 was part of NATO already. But what on earth is France going to do sending troops in Eastern Europe? There is no reason. There was no reason at the time. Mm. And I was very tempted not to write that particular prophecy in my book, simply out of fear that um, Marie-Julie Genie would not be taken seriously. And then I told to myself, à la grâce de Dieu, au pied de la croix, which means in English, at the grace of God, at the feet of the cross. And I wrote it all. I, so, I thought to myself, I'm not going to commit the same fault, error that the church did 
by making silent a prophecy. Which you're not going with, to you're not, you're not gonna withhold anything. Exactly. And I did not. Thank goodness I didn't, because today France has sent quite a few thousand troops in Romania, in uh, Latvia and Estonia, and nothing less than a nuclear aircraft carrier uh, with a complement of uh, surface and, and, sur and submarine uh, vessels to accompany it in the Adriatic Sea, um, patrolling the national airspace of Romania. No? So it makes complete sense, while at the same time sending thousands of troops in Mali, which we, are leave, which we have left, Niger, Cameroon, Chad, Central Republic and Africa, Benin, Côte d'Ivoire, and other old um, nations that used to be part of the French Empire. So all this, again, Marie-Julie Jenny was right. So what is next? A third world conflict, she says. After there will be a grace that will be granted by God upon all of humanity, for them to be aware of the sinful state of their souls, the way God sees them. Very much like the prophecy of Garavandal given to the children, to Conchita Gonzalez and to the other children. She mentioned that this particular gift from God would be given to all of humanity. And then there would be this blitzkrieg that would take place in Europe. Eastern European nations, particularly Russia, will form a sort of coalition with Muslim uh, nations and would start a blitzkrieg of sorts that would pulverize all the defenses from the Belarusian um, borders all the way first to the Rhine River. The Muslims on their side would disembark in southern Italy, southern France, La Costa del Sol in España, and Andalusia in south Spain, while the Russians, making a brief pause on the Rhine River, would finally take a gamble, throw the dice, and see if France would retaliate with nuclear weapons by crossing the French border, the Benelux nations, Holland, Belgium, uh, Luxembourg, and cross through three prin principal axes of attacks. The principal axe of attack will not be Paris. It will be the city of Orléans and then the city of Nantes with the strongest force aiming at reaching the Atlantic. The second strongest uh, axe of attack will be P Picardy, Normandy and Paris, which will resist the, the advance of the Russians for 45 days, only to succumb because of lack of ammunition. And the third principal axe of attack will be through Switzerland, the French Alps and central France, where the Russians will meet with a uh, Arabic and Muslim inf invasion force that will have disembarked from southern France. France will be taken by a very quick blitzkrieg of sorts and no help. The Virgin Mary was very clear to Marie-Julie Chani. No help will come from her allies. Why? And this opens another can of worms. I think that's the American expression. However, France and the remnants of the NATO forces that would have been pushed back, swept away all the way from Poland to the Atlantic, will form a stable front from Cherbourg all the way to Bordeaux. All the Atlantic coast of France, Brittany, part of Normandy, Vendée and Touraine will remain under French control after a major battle which will take place in Nantes and which will end up with a French victory, but at a tremendously expensive cost. Mm. At that time, the front will remain stable and Spain will be practically uh, pushed back to the Atlantic as well. The king will be forced for a very short period of time to leave Spain, only to return with reinforcements and to push back afterwards the Muslim out of Spain. France, on the other hand, will see a privileged soul leave France with the instructions to go and seek the descendant of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette who, although would have been born in France, would not live in France, but abroad. This man will be called Henri V de la Croix, Henry V of the Cross, and will come and show himself and prove his true origins as the descendant of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Many royalists, Freemasons, Republicans will turn their back on him, but they will be remarkable enough, those who will defend him the most, will be non-royalist, but rather Republicans, Democratics, the, the Republicans, who will see in this man the, safe, the savior of France. Mm. This man, through miraculous means, will finally take control of the French army, and there will be another false king who will be from the House of Orléans. The House of Orléans, again, is very complicated, especially for foreigners, but 
the royal house was divided into at the moment of the revolution. Um, the heir of the house of Orléans during the revolution was a cousin of Louis XVI, whose name was Philip. And then he called himself Philippe Egalité. He was on the side of the Republicans. And his vote, his vote alone, was the one that caused the guillotine for his cousin Louis XVI. And because of this, he and all of his descendants have been condemned by God the, Heav God the Father from ever reigning again in France, at least not for a substantial amount of time. But will be the descendant of the House of Orléans who will reign with a government of collaboration with the Russians and Muslims in order to maintain order and unity in France in collaboration with the Russians and the Muslims. However, the real French king, Henry V of the Cross, will come from abroad, take control of the small French army made of a few allies, but principally of the French army, whatever is left, and will massacrate and pulverize all the Russian defenses and all the defense, the lines of defense that the Russians will have built in France. The Muslims will be thrown to the sea. The Russians will be pushed back to the Rhine. But before they leave, the marie Jeanne has likewise, like in La Salette, confirmed a prophecy, which the Russians, which states that the Russians, as they will withdraw from the city of Orléans and the city of Paris, will launch at night two nuclear missiles in the middle of the night towards Paris, which will pulverize and flatten completely the capital of France. It will make the city succumb in a crater that will have no bottom. It will be a bottomless crater. And the version was told Marie Jeanne that the day will come when, in the future, a father will take his little boy to the border of this crater and tell his son, my son, here used to lie a great city. Paris will be will cease to exist. And out of all the about 9, 10 millions of citizens in Paris and in the suburbs, only 100 minus 12 will survive. Those are the words of the Virgin Mary, 88. People will only survive. The King of France will finally be crowned in the usual places in the Cathedral of Reims. They are, there is understanding that Paris, out of Paris, the city, principal city, the Lille de la Cité, the center of the center, will survive in the Cathedral of Notre Dame miraculously will survive in this little island in the center of Paris, where the King of France will also be crowned. But he will be crowned as his ancestors before him in the Cathedral of Reims. Whatever is remains of it, it will be poorly decorated, but it will stand on its feet as it has for centuries before then. The Russians will be pushed back out of France, beyond the Rhine, Part of Belgium, Holland, and Germany will be freed. Part of Switzerland and Northern Italy will be freed. The King of Spain, with a smaller force yet, will join the King of his cousin, the King of France, and will start a campaign to liberate Italy and Rome to place there upon the seat of Peter a new Pope, an angelic Pope. Oh. But before all this takes place, during the course of this horrific war, there will be chastisement not only made by men, but by God. And one of those chastisements will be the spreading of a particular mortal disease called the burning plague. This burning plague disease will be nothing like we've seen before and will be extremely contagious and airborne and will be the cause of millions and millions of victims. The Virgin Mary told Marie Jeanne, the medical and scientific art of man will find itself unable to come with an answer to beat this disease and the spreading of this virus. Mm. There will be only one remedy that I will give you, my children. All this is in my book. And the remedy, and I beg your pardon for my English pronunciation, which is ghastly, is the hawthorn. Hawthorn leaf. It's not easy to pronounce. I don't That's know. That's absolutely you... correct. <laughs> you get it. The hawthorn leaf will be the only remedy that will be able to cure man from this ghastly and mortal disease, if taken in time. The Virgin furthermore explained how to use it. She asked that a particular tea be made, that a, in a pot, boiling water be prepared. And I know it sounds ludic ludicrous, uh, ridiculous. It sounds like a movie plot. It took me a long time to accept it, but no longer. The Virgin asked that in this boiling pot, 
we make water boil and place those leaves of hawthorn and place a cup a tap above the pot with the boiling water and the leaves of hawthorn yes. and to yes. wait for 14 minutes, not 13 minutes, not 15 minutes, but 14 minutes. 14 After minutes. The 14, one four. After the 14 minutes are gone, to turn off the fire, open the cup of the pot and use this tea, apply it three times a day, either by consumption and or application on the body. Mm. And to do it regularly every three every day, three times a day until all the symptoms disappear. The version might say that if you take this particular remedy too late, it will not save a person but it will alleviate his or her sufferings. There are other remedies that the Virgin May has given through Marie-Julie Jeannie for cholera, among which also the Hawthorne, other remedies. It's all very long, but it's clearly explained in the book. Uh, the Virgin furthermore told Marie-Julie Jeannie that this plague will be disastrous. The war will cause a tremendous amount of victims throughout the entire planet. Um, Russia will be pushed back, punished tremendously. And the final prophecies, the final chastisement that will come upon humanity will translate through what Marie Jeannie calls the three days of darkness. Yes, same prophecy. Day. Yes, same prophecy, by, by the way, which has been brought forth by Saint Padre Pio oh. for two reports he, he wrote to the Holy Vatican and others which have been formerly recognized by the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. The three days of darkness will come after Rome is liberated and a Pope, a holy Catholic Pope, be placed again back by the King on the seat of Peter. Those three days of darkness will be the last purification of the world and will have a decree instituted by our God the Father, our Lord and God the Father, to the angel destroyer, to eliminate and execute all the enemies of religion, all the enemies of goodness and of the church installed by his son, Jesus Christ. Now, what I'm about to say, if, it, if what I've already said is not shocking enough, will be even more shocking. The Virgin Mary told Marie-Julie Jeannie that during those three days of darkness, three quarters of the world population will cease to exist. Three quarters. Um, but that from the remainings, the re remnants of the population on the earth, a new world will rise better than has never seen before. A renaissance, a rebirth of a Catholic uh, society, of a church that will return to the tradition of yesteryears, to the um, commandments of yesteryears, to the uh, sacraments of yesterday's years. It will be a rebirth and a great, after three years of reconstructions, hardship, the world will find prosperity again, serenity, love, and universal peace. Now, those are the great lines, the big lines of the prophecies of Marie-Julie Jeannie. As I said, these particular messages have never been condemned are still being investigated informally here and there. I thought it was time for this book to be written in English. And for me, uh, I want to make it clear, I've, I've seen and read many comments by uh, throughout other shows that I've done. The importance was not at all to make money at all. I'm royally indifferent. For me, it was um, the only means I could think to thank heaven for the family that I have, the stability of my home, of two wonderful American, Franco-American children I adore, I absolutely adore, for all the graces that have been granted, I could not say, or find any other means to say merci to heaven. But at the same time, um, another of my aspirations was to redeem what my countrymen, particularly the Bishop of Grenoble, um, his vile cowardice by trying to hide away the secret of La Salette, by trying to redeem all those bishops, cardinals, popes, who hid purposely the third secret of Fatima, not just, not just John the 23rd, 
but his successors as well. Paul the Sixth, John freedom. Paul, John Paul the First. Well, John Paul the First died under most suspicious conditions after three thirty-three days of reign. But afterwards, John Paul the Second. Yes, I know you understood, and I'm sure many of your viewers as well. Oh yes. This does not mean that we must condemn the church. The version again and again, particularly in the latest apparitions, such as Garabandal, for instance, ask us to pray for the Pope. I do not mind telling you that there is nothing I agree with that the Pope has written in his encycl encyclicals. I do not agree with his choice of appointments in the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. I do not agree with the crusade he has, is undertaking against those who are guilty of the unforgivable crime of loving God, Christ, and the Virgin Mary, the way our fathers, and theirs before them, indeed before us. I do not agree with his opening his arms to pagans, to non-Catholics, to Pachamamas, no? Anglicans, I had an argument once, I, I love to tell the story, whether John Henry Westons or... <laughs> or Taylor Marshalls or others, or the shows. But I had an argument some time ago with an Englishman, an Englishman, and a Frenchman, so, you know, we are like dog, dogs and cats. And he was telling me, oh, well, you, Xavier, my old boy, you see that your Pope, indeed, is, could possibly be the Vicar of Christ. After all, did he not invite those bloody pagans on holy grounds in the Vatican? <laughs> you can't possibly be serious. So I he added. <laughs> Good English more, accent, by the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's more, he said, no, 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 no. What's more, old boy? I'll have you know that we Englishmen call your Pope the Pacha Papa. Oh, no, <laughs> oh, jeepers. I tell you honestly, I couldn't keep, I couldn't, I was biting my tongue because I wanted to laugh. It was hilarious. Yes. But, I told him, look, uh, his name was Jeffrey. Look, Jeffrey, you lost a beautiful opportunity to be quiet, but you're not one on one occasion or more or less from uh, proving that ridicule doesn't kill. So let's just turn the page and let's not talk about this anymore and let's be good friends. So I said, all right, old boy, let's not talk about it. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, in the depth of my heart, I, I agreed with him. What this Pope did by permitting such uh, idolatry was to make himself an accomplice thereof. By looking upon these men and women on their knees, praying to a false goddess, Pachamama, asking her to bless the earth and produce the grounds upon which they will grow their vegetables and they produce, by looking upon them with a very fatherly uh, smile, permitting this to happen was nothing short but complicity of idolatry. This not, notwithstanding, I pray for the Holy Father. No, I pray for Francis. And I, there is a reason I corrected myself. Mm. I pray for Francis with all my heart, who has de facto taken the position of the Pope. I pray for his conversion. John Henry Weston, um, some months ago, went to Canada when uh, the Pope came to visit uh, the city of Quebec, I believe. And with some um, uh, traditionalist priest, uh, he got on his knees on the street and began to pray the rosary for, the, for Pope Francis, for his conversion. I think that's exactly what we must do. One of the traps that is set before us is condemnation, con criticism. It, it does not belong to us to condemn a person or not. If we see somebody making an error, even as highly pleased as Pope Francis, we must pray for him. But it, we must not leave the vessel of the Catholic Church. It is up to the enemies of Christ to leave the, the, the vessel. You will not resolve the problem by abandoning ship. We must remain on board and spiritually take our shields and our swords and fight with all our might through prayer, charity, peace and love. But we must pray. And this is our sword. The day will come when. Go ahead. I beg your pardon. Uh, if we we're going to conclude, um, I just wanted to ask um, just one question about 
Garabando, there's supposed to be a visible sign that will remain forever at the pines mm -hmm. at Garabando. Um, is this associated with the three days of darkness, the sequence? Yes. Is it? It is. Uh, in Garabandal, a place, by the way, and so as to make it very clear, because I, I will read some of the comments afterwards, and mm -hmm. sometimes I hear people making comments that are erroneous, that are not true, when they say that it's been condemned by the church. It's never been condemned by the church. It's not been approved yet, but it's still under investigation. But okay. it is not condemned by the church. So it is not a sin to believe or talk about it. So to respond to your question, in Garabandal, there were prophecies of three events to come. There would be a warning, followed by a miracle on Pine Hill, followed by the chastisement, if humanity does not convert in time. The warning, number one, is supposed to take place within one year before the permanent miracle on Pine Hill is to take place. The warning, as Marie-Julie Jeanne herself stated, will be a moment that will last, according to Conchita Gonzalez, if memory serves, for about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. It will be for every human being alive on the surface of planet Earth. They will be able at the same time to see and review the state of their souls, yeah. the way God sees them himself. It will be in complete honesty, yeah. without any interest or any modification uh, or interested modification. You will be able to see in sheer honesty whether after you pass away, you would go to hell, purgatory, or heaven. Many people will be shocked by the result of this experience. And some of them will, according to uh, Conchita Gonzalez, will die of a heart attack out of sheer shock. The immense majority of the world population naturally will survive. But at that moment, when this experience will finish, every single human being will be able to understand that there is only one God and that the God, the one God is indeed Jesus Christ and that the one true church on earth is the church, the only church that Jesus Christ has founded upon Peter. When he told Peter, you are Peter and you are rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Everyone will understand that at that moment. And the lines of confession will be endless throughout the world. Ah. But this will only last but a very little amount of time. This will last according to, according to other visionaries, including a famous one, which today has not been condemned either, but is a man of the cloth, a renowned one, Father Michel Rodriguez from the region of Quebec. He has not been condemned. Simply the her local bishops have not supported him as of yet because there's not been, as of yet, a formal investigation. Yes. But he has not been condemned in any way, shape or form. So according to his prophecies and others, there will be about 40 days, six weeks approximately, where the devil will be prohibited from interfering into human affairs. It does not mean that man will lose his freedom to choose between good and evil, he will still have the freedom, but he will not be able to use his ruse to lead men astray, the devil that is. So man will convert and will ask for confession, will return to God until after six weeks, uh, the scientific community, along with geopolitical uh, leaders and elite, will state and will prove that indeed during this period of time, there will have been a tremendous, extraordinary solar tempest in the universe, in the space, which will have not only affected countless satellites in orbit around the world, around the Earth, but likewise would have caused mass hysteria throughout our brain waves or would have caused mass illusions in our ways of thinking. A great many people will believe and will fall out from grace. A minority will maintain their faith firm. At that time, people will be called to not only to protect their souls, but their bodies. That's another story we can talk into another time. But after that, about a year, within the next 12 months thereafter, there will be the permanent miracle in Pine Hill, in Garabandal, in Spain. In, yes. Spain. in that particular place, the version promised that there will be a sign that will prove unquestionably 
that she did appear to the girls uh, in the little village of Garamandal. And that particular sign will be will not be able to be touched or mm. felt, but it will be there. Mm. It will be able to be taken through a photography or videos, mm. but it will not be able to be moved or felt or touched or eliminated. And it will remain there until the end of the existence of the world, of the earth. Wow. Then the third prophecy. After that, if humanity does not convert, and when Conchita Gonzalez was asked by a BBC journalist in 1980 whether she believed or not that humanity would change, she answered, I do not believe humanity will change. But the message went as this. If humanity changes, the chastisement will be eliminated. Otherwise, there will be a chastisement greater than the deluge that will purify uh, the, the entire human race. Something that we're not looking forward to. I know we're limited on time. Uh, I simply would uh, invite your telespectators, your viewers, to check on the internet the message of Akita, formerly approved apparition site by uh, the Bishop Ito and by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome, I believe it was in 1980, by His Eminence Cardinal Ratzinger, future Pope Benedict XVI. Mm. Right now, the Bishop of Akita is trying with all his might to silence the poor old lady, the poor old sister Sasagawa, and to bury deep in the earth this particular prophecy, which is chilling, and which, according to the own words of Cardinal Ratzinger, is nothing less but the echo of the third secret of Fatima. Ah. The details of which we we don't know. I found it on my book, through Cardinal Ottaviani. We know what the third secret of Fatima okay. is, yeah. and it is reflected principally in the message of October 13th, 1973, in Akita, through Miss Sister Sasagawa. Do I have time to give you a brief account, a brief anecdote, how Akita was uh, was approved? Of course. The big message of the 13th of October 1973 is, in fact, the 56th anniversary of the last apparition of Our Lady of Fatima, the miracle of the sun, October 13th, 1917. Oh, yes. 56 years later is the message of Akita, which, according to Cardinal Rasinger, is the third secret of Fatima. Akita, like every apparition site, and these are not my words, but Father René Laurentin. I'm yes. trying to use an American accent. As I, use it. <laughs> I should stop that. <laughs> but uh, Jeffrey, my English friend, would probably be making fun of me if you were here. But okay. nevertheless, <laughs> um, like every true apparition site, uh, Akita was subject to defamation, attacks, criticism, very much like Fatima, very much like La Salette, very much like all the true apparition sites which have later been approved by the Catholic Church. Akita was no exception. And as you know, the, in, in the convent of Akita, there was a wooden statue of Our Lady of All Nations that was weeping tears, sweating human yeah. sweat, and bleeding human blood. Very much like Sister Sasagawa, who also got a stigmata. Anyway, Bishop Ito uh, hired a scientist who was renowned for being an atheist, so that nobody could accuse him to have organized some sort of plot, Catholic plot, to prove and justify the unjustifiable. Mm -hmm. So he chose this particular scientist who was atheist and organized a dossier with all the results of the analysis of the tears, the sweat, mm -hmm. and the blood that was produced by this wooden statue. Uh, finally, Bishop Ito was convinced, set up his dossier, and decided to go to take what the Americans call the red eye, I believe you said, mm -hmm. uh, flight from Tokyo to Rome direct and meet with Cardinal Ratzinger, whom he knew was being bombarded every day with all kinds of mediocrity, false accusations, defamations on Sister Sasagawa, the poor little sisters there, and mm. the apparition site. Mm. He went there to defend the, the position and to declare the apparition site worthy of belief. But he wanted the support of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. He arrived, exhausted, brought the dossier, and was explaining the circumstances to Cardinal Ratzinger, who was listening, perplexed, but listening nonetheless. At the end, the bishop, uh, Ito, gave him the last message he had received on the 56th anniversary of the miracle of the sun in Fatima, October 13th, 1973. 
And when uh, the Cardinal read it from the first line till the end, Cardinal Ratzinger told uh, Bishop Ito, Excellency, we will not continue this conversation anymore. The matter is closed. There will be no further investigation of Akita. Alarm. All the bells in his mind started to ring. But eminence, you have to understand why not? You do not, you haven't had all of my evidence. You haven't read all the scientific results. And this message was nothing but the last message Sister Sasakawa received. You have to give us a chance, uh, your eminence. And the cardinal stopped Bishop Ito at once and told him, no, no, no. Eminence, you, um, Excellency, you do not understand. There will be no further investigation and no further conversation on the matter because as of today, Rome and the congregation of the doctrine of the faith will declare the apparitions to Sister Sasagawa in Akita as being worthy of belief. Oh. The Bishop oh. Ito was wow. surprised and began to say, but your eminence, forgive me, but can you tell me what made you change your mind from one moment to the other? And please tell me quickly, because my heart is really beating at a pace that I can't stand anymore. And the Cardinal answered, it's very simple. Because this message that Sister Sasagawa received on October 13th, 1973, incredibly enough, on the 56th anniversary, on the last apparition of Our Lady in Fatima, showing the miracle of the sun, is nothing else, nothing short but the third secret of Fatima, which to this day has been kept secret. Oh, That so is why a... today these apparitions are will be approved. So it has to be supernatural because it's been secret. And here it is coming out of Attica. Exactly. You hit again the, the nail on the head. That's the story. I don't want to abuse any more of your time. I know that uh, as my friend Jeffrey, the blooming Englishman would tell me, <laughs> I'm long-winded, but uh, it was a pleasure. And I'm ever so grateful you gave me an opportunity to talk to you. Uh, you have you're been a very kind gentleman. And to your viewers, whom I hope will be touched. I'd like to finish with one more thing. Last, yes. it will be very short. The general message of the Virgin Mary, whether in Akita, in Fatima, in La Salette, or La Frode, resumes itself to this. And this, I ask your auditors to listen with all your heart. Those are not my words, but those are the words coming from a loving and imploring mother from heaven who wants only your salvation. Convert. Convert now, before it's too late. Convert through the following process. Go and convert to the Roman Catholic Church. Read, leave the Gospels of my son. Read and leave Holy Catechism. Leave the Holy Sacraments of the Catholic Church, particularly Holy Confession. Go to confession, preferably, every first Saturdays of every month. Go to Holy Communion every Sunday. Why believing that it is truly the holy body, body and blood, soul and divinity of my dearly beloved son, Jesus Christ? Do not believe it is a symbol, for that is the purpose and the aim of the enemy of my son, to make you believe that it is not truly my son, but truly nothing less than a piece of bread that is meant to be given in commemoration of the Last Supper. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yes. Do believe and receive the body of my son properly prepared. Yes. If you suspect you've committed a grave sin, a mortal sin, do not receive the body of Christ before you receive Holy Communion. If you follow these precepts, if you pray the Holy Rosary, if you confess every month, if you receive every Sunday the body of my son, if you read and leave the Holy Gospels, the teachings of my son and catechism, those will be for in your hands the keys of your salvation and trust. Do not be afraid. Do not condemn. Have mercy for your enemies and trust that God and my Son, who is part of the Holy Trinity, will come to rescue you if you ask him from the heart and repent from your sins. That is the cornerstone of the message that heaven wants to bring forth to the faithful. I hope I was not too theatrical, but I meant it from the bottom of my heart, as one yeah. Catholic to others. And I thank you for your kindness. Thank you, Xavier. Your book, 
Revelations, which I will read, I promise. And you were right. I couldn't read it all this weekend. It's it's fairly fairly <laughs> substantial. So I've got some studying to do. And I, I, I sure hope that you and I can stay in touch. I feel like you're one of my best friends. How's that? Uh, so do I. And you are not wrong. I am. I, oh. I congratulate myself on calling myself so. Thank you very much again. And union in prayer. Union prière, mon ami. Mon ami. Merci. Mon Merci. ami. Ha, ha, ha.